and welcome everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Natalie Fritz and I am the archivist and director of collections outreach and social media for the Clark County Historical Society. Uh, so a lot of the fun things I get to do are find things to share uh, and that we get to share online and things that we share in the newspaper. Uh, and uh, for the last uh, more than two years now, we've been doing virtual programs like this as a chance to uh, uh, we, we've been doing programs like this as a chance to share stuff. And uh, we are always looking for new topics to share. And this is one that we had uh, quite a bit of information in our collection because um, the funerary industry uh, was a, something that grew up uh, out of necessity. Um, and, it, and it grew up big here in Springfield uh, following the Civil War. Uh, because that was that the deaths from the Civil War made um, it was death was a very frequent visitor in the American household and undertakers uh, the industry that that you know they needed more caskets and that, that kind of grew up out of um, uh, there might have they might have been carpenters before that and that was kind of one something that went hand in hand and then the industry that went along with that. Um, advances in embalming and uh, in, the, in the casket industry with the metallic caskets to, to help protect. That was something that um, became a really big industry here in Springfield specifically that was um, used throughout the world. Uh, so I'm uh, taking this opportunity to share some things that we have specifically in our collections, but we don't have um, things that represent the entire um, scope of things here in the area. Um, but the two of the biggest companies were uh, Springfield Metallic Casket and Champion Chemical Company. So um, I have some slides here to share some of this, but um, we have Jack Conroy here with us from Conroy Funeral Home, and uh, he'll be able to, uh, throughout this presentation, to, to come in and, and share stories and tell more information. And uh, these are always kind of a laid back affair where we encourage anybody who joins to, to tell us more information. Or if you recognize somebody in a photo or if you know something more, uh, this is your time to, to chime in and um, let us know because we record these uh, for posterity so that if anybody's looking for this information in the future, uh, they'll be able to uh, do a search and, and find um, stuff about Springfield, Ohio that we've uh, uh, saved here. So. So this is uh, some of what we have here in uh, the galleries. This is this is where we represent it out in the uh, on the museum side. We have a lot more stuff in the in the archives, but uh, we have this display out in our expo hall uh, where we've got some products uh, that were manufactured by the um, Champion Chemical Company. They they made stuff just be, beyond chemicals as well. Uh, so. Uh, Jack, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the items that we have out here. I know we've got, um, I think, a cooling table and stuff on the one side of the hearse. Uh, and then on the other side, we have some a cross section of one of the metallic caskets. Um, um, well, the cooling table, of course, that's portable. And I know when my grandfather first opened up here in Springfield, which was in 1919, um, before that, when he after he graduated, he traveled a lot. and uh, he traveled out to Washington State when he first got out of mortuary school, and he actually did embalming back into the um, where the lumberjacks were out in Washington State. They would they would get killed out there on the job, and they couldn't get them out because of the snow. So he would travel back into there and and actually embalm the bodies back in there. And he would take these tables with him to be able to position bodies and everything. And, we had, I don't know, that almost looks like the one we used to have. I don't know, we have one identical to that at the funeral home. Um, but then when he came back and opened up down on uh, Lagunda, um, they actually went to the home and did a lot of embalming in the home uh, where his wife went with him and helped out. And they would embalm actually in the bedrooms of where the death occurred and the bodies would stay there all the time until they would do the the wakes back then at, in, the, in the funeral home. So. That's what that cooling board is, is kept now. They call it a cooling board, but it was a position board that they would embalm on uh, in the home, which uh, I, you know, that's, that's the description of what I see so far. Uh, I can't see instruments or anything yet. Well, I say, I don't think I got a close up of the instrument uh, section that we have. On the other side of the, the hearse here, we have a little um, display case that has 
um, metal uh, long handled instruments. And uh, I, I talked to you a little bit about this earlier that we've, we've looked at that before, um, different places in the museum where we could give a little bit more detail as to what it specifically artifacts are, things like that. And I know that uh, Kyle was in there in the, there at one point and said, oh, I can help identify some of this stuff. And we thought, well, depends on how much detail we want to give people. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. that might be something maybe we have as an extra um, that we can provide. Maybe you got you can look at it and you guys can help us provide a little more detail that we can have um, available um, for people that really want to know that come through the museum that might want a little bit more information. We can have um, some that that we could provide them. Um, because uh, we didn't go into a lot of detail. We just have a nice aesthetic display of, of uh, some of the, the tools that would have been used. Okay. So that's what people see on, on this side. I, I have, um, this is some of the stuff from the archives. Uh, so the, the Champion Chemical Company um, was, uh, I think, founded in 1887. Where's that? Or let's see, it was uh, 1876. So uh, in 1887, they got some more patents and that's when Alonzo Baker here got involved. Um, and uh, Baker, dot, no wait, that's, is that, that's Scipio. Alonzo was, A.A. A. Baker was originally got involved, 1895. He died and his son Scipio, um, who was Margaret's father, um, took over. Uh, the company, and then they uh, they built their plant on Linden Avenue, which I believe this is the picture um, of the plant on Linden. Still there, yeah. And then in, uh, by 1920, they were selling virtually anything that you required. So we've got uh, quite a selection of of catalogs in um, in the collection. Um, and um, Margaret took over. Here, let me go back one. Um, Marty, you had mentioned that you had met uh, Margaret Baker at one point. We know that she was also a filmmaker, um, but she took over after um, yes, her so mother. I, 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 yes, I was going to say, she also was quite a world traveler. I met her in several times. because she, My father joined Champion Company in 1950, and he left in 1989, I believe it was. So he was with the company over that period. But I remember meeting Margaret Baker on many occasions. because she was, she was the head of the, of the company after uh, you know, her, her father had died. Uh, but um, she traveled around the world a lot. Uh, as far as I know, she, she did not marry. She was in college. And I mean, one of her friends that she met in college was Madame Chiang Kai-shek. And she uh, was very, very big, very big promoter of the nationalist Chinese cause, <laughs> uh, you know, after the fall of uh, China to, to the communists and Chiang being in Taiwan and all that. She was very close to that. She also, by the way, politically was very close to the Taft family. She was a big supporter of uh, Robert Taft Sr., the senator, uh, you know, in the 50s. And so she was quite a, quite a name in, in Republican politics, uh, but quite a world traveler. So she had an amazing international and national career apart from her identity with the Champion Company. Well, well I know she... Still a, a, uh, didn't they have a plant up in Canada somewhere too at one point? Do you remember I that? think they did, yeah. Yeah. I don't know much about it, but I knew she used to travel up there to the Canada to that location. Yeah, or whatever manufacturing they did up there. And she took over and um, after her mother died in 1946. And from our understand, she was pretty, pretty young back then. We actually have some of uh, Margaret's uh, films from around the world um, are in, really? our, in our collection, some of her, her real film of, uh, from different countries. Um, this was a nice little uh, uh, insert page from, I think, one of their 1905 catalogs. Uh, it says, the preparation of the body to be viewed by the sorrowing family and the sympathetic friends is the medium through which the funeral director rises to the heights or is condemned. It is through the embalming, the restoration of features, expressions, and colors that the immediate family derives its greatest solace from its ministration. So then this whole catalog goes through any, any product that you would need, and uh, they were making... Um, everything at that time. Um, this is back in um, 1905. Uh, so I thought that this is this is showing one of their um, burger, burglar proof grave vaults. And uh, Jack, a question I had for you was, when did this start to become uh, a, a normal product? I mean, that was out there was the, these, uh, the, the vaults that people would purchase. 
Well, you know, probably the late 1800s is what I'm going to guess. You know, that you know they buried some of those people with with jewelry or you know money for one reason or another, and they they did have grave robbers back then, and that was that's why they went with steel vaults back then. They used to at one point they used wood, um, and of course eventually wood would rot and it would cave in. Um, and then the cemeteries, if it was in a cemetery, it would cave down. You know, the family cemeteries, you don't have any regulation there, but um, most of the cemeteries around here require vaults. Most of them, a, a good portion of them, probably 90% of what they use today is probably concrete. Um, and the only purpose for that, those today are, is to keep the grave from settling and sinking. Um, it's a maintenance purpose. Uh, that's why they require vaults today. But the steel vaults, they still sell them. Um, you know, they, they offer protection as they want to call it, um, you know, but the body is still going to deteriorate some. Um, wow. so, uh, no, you know, the biggest I, data I, is that could make. What's that? Well, I thought somebody asked a question. Oh. Uh, but anyway, they still sell them, but it's, it's a minimum amount, probably less than 10% of the faults they sell today are steel. Um, and then I think that expanded once they started making vaults like that. Then I think that's when they ex expanded probably into these containers um, that Champion was known for over the years after they expanded the vaults. I think vaults were probably the first container that they built. I would think, Marty, if I'm right, then they went into the containers for jet engines and, and you know, for the military. They did a lot of military yeah, contracts. Yes, they, 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 you know, the, the, the building, there were a couple of different buildings there on Harrison Street where the Champion Company is today, the main building is. And then they had one building there with the plant area where they, they took on additional contracts and they made containers, you're absolutely right, for jet engines and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's one of the later later catalogs we have. And one of the a, a later slide shows some of um, the uh, containers that they were making there. Uh, some more products here. Uh, Jack, the, the, the badge is on here. Was this more of a, a thing of the time to it have was. this on your door? Yes. Yes, it was. It, before my time, um, probably more, again, turn of the century and, and early century, early 19th century, that, um, you know, they put them on the door to, to let people know that they're, like you said, they were in mourning. Um, and it would be for a period sometimes of, you know, a week to 10 days maybe uh, for family to be able to travel in. Um, and most of all, you know, a lot of that viewing was done at the home back then, not in, not at the funeral home as, as it, it slowly moved into the funeral home. But we, I still, I think I did three or four when I first got out of school back in uh, the early 70s where we, there were still families that had never used a funeral home. They all brought their families to their home and we did three or four of those out in the north end of, over the years early on. Um, so, but that's that's basically what those were used for, you know, just to, and they, and, you know, put them on businesses when the businesses were closed, closed up also, you know, so people knew why they were closed, that there was a death in the family. So, yeah, exactly. I know, I know the, um, the home, you know, keeping people at home, that's something that, um, when people, I, I, I see and when people come to do research about um, death certificates toward around the turn of the century, um, we, I always tell people that there's some people that just kind of slip through the cracks because um, it didn't have to be reported necessarily. Um, so there's a certain time period where we, we have records for both the health department and the probate court that cover deaths and persons missing from both records. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's still in the era of people, you know, died in their homes or maybe, you know, didn't go through the whole process that, you know, we're used to today. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I'm going to go back a little bit here, Natalie, that, um, there was a, there was a guy, his name was Joseph Clark and he was a casket salesman back during the civil war days. And during that time, he, he found, and, and this is, some of this is, is public knowledge, of course, that. As, as the war continued and soldiers were being killed away from home, they were trying to get them back home. And that's when the embalming started was to, to get these soldiers home. And Clark recognized that there was a need for that. And so he, he went to a medical school, I think it was in Philadelphia and talked to an anatomy professor there. And between the two of them, they developed, he's, Clark is known as the, the father of modern embalming. And so he, 
he traveled to Boston and, and down south and Philadelphia and all the all the major towns and taught classes to, to men, mostly men, uh, on how to embalm. Um, and I found some records where he actually spent time in the late 1800s in Springfield. And I wonder if, if he wasn't uh, part of the Champion Company early development that Clark didn't come in and, and together they worked together because he was only here a few years. And then when he, after he left here, he ended up going down to Cincinnati and opened up the very first uh, school of embalming. It was a Cincinnati College of, or Cincinnati School of Embalming is what it was. And uh, that that was in the late 1800s. And then I had, a, my grandfather graduated down there in 1906. And I think he was like 16 years old when he graduated from mortuary school. Um, and then after he graduated, that's when he went out west and was doing that traveling and embalming out, out west for a while. And then came back here in the, well, he opened up here in 1919. Uh, so I think Clark probably was instrumental and Clark actually was, was the gentleman who embalmed Ulysses S. Grant. Um, he's, he was known for that, which I thought was pretty interesting. And then he came back and, and he was the actual teacher of my grandfather at the time. And, uh, they became pretty good friends over the years. And, uh, he had offered him a position at the school after he graduated, even at that age to come back and teach. He never did. Uh, he was what he came back and did some seminars, I think, but never stayed to teach. But it was the, Clark was really instrumental in getting a lot of this early uh, manufacturing started. And it, you know, Springfield at that time was it was vital, um, like all the other industries, the ag business that they were in, and everything else that Springfield and Clark County had. Uh, so Clark was probably instrumental in, in getting some of this embalming fluid uh, developed, and then. When Marty's dad came in, formaldehyde is a very strong chemical, and it, it's actually a gas in, in its li in liquid form. Um, and not to get too technical, but it's, I mean, it's it's a strong, it'll burn your eyes and make your nose run and everything else. And, and Marty's dad developed a, a glutaraldehyde. It was, it was kind of a spinoff of it that was less offensive. And a lot of the fluids that Champion made after Marty's dad got there, Lee, uh, he was just a brilliant guy, and he developed a whole new series of chemicals that were less offensive. And because it was it was difficult to embalm back then, because the chemicals you you could mix your own. They had a lot of a lot of funeral homes made their own, so they had the stronger chemicals. But then Champion, when they started making the glutaraldehydes, more in my dad and my generation, it, it became a lot more uh, a lot simpler to handle. Uh, and so, and Marty's dad was responsible for all that, the development of the glue out of hide. I remember dad doing some help, doing some work with him over the years when he was in the early stages of developing that. So uh, that was all attributed to, to Mr. Rendon. So we were in, when I was in mortuary school, I remember we, we would come back. Uh, they would do uh, trips, day trips from the mortuary school in Cincinnati. And of course, Champion Company was the largest manufacturer at one time. Uh, of champion of embalming chemicals. So we would have a tour up there and they'd take us through the plant. I remember Marty's dad, they always took me off the side and we always did these photo ops because I was the local kid. <laughs> and, and then uh, <laughs> from there we'd go the, down to uh, Springfield Metallic. And, you know, and, and Springfield Metallic was the largest manufacturer in the world at one time of caskets. So, and I know that's, you've got some pictures of that later on too. Yeah. But I thought yeah. that Clark, uh, connection was was pretty interesting yeah I, i'd be interested to look his name up and see if there's an if he um what kind of records he comes yeah. up in in the yeah, late 1800s part. it'll pop right up so uh, so this is some more uh, i had a question specifically about the the slumber room bed is that just for um general decor in a funeral home or i'm not sure this was uh Designed to save valuable space in a funeral home where a single bed purchased from a furniture manufacturer. Is this just to decorate the other rooms in the funeral home? That's what it was. I was confused about this piece of this thing that they were selling in the catalog. Well, I know that at one point, a lot of funeral homes sold furniture as a second, you know, form of income. And that's probably has something to do with 
I'm trying to see here. It said, um, if a new funeral home is being planned, approximately 10 square feet can be eliminated from the size of the room if this bed is used instead of a standard single bed. Hmm. So this just... Unless they laid the person out in the bed. Yeah, that's what... That's I'm what not sure if that was a... Um, yeah, that's yeah. what it seems like, that they probably just laid them in more of a natural position, hmm. you know, before they buried them, I guess, you know, before they got into some of the, you know, before they put them in the casket, I guess. I knew, you know, children and everything, they would, of course, the old Irish wakes, they'd stand the guy in the corner, you know, how they used to do that, I guess. But they, you'd always heard those stories, you know, yeah. let's get old Patrick out of here and get take him down to the bar or something, you know, so. What's, I, what's I, the uh, machine on the right? And on this That's slide, like embalming machine. Yeah, um, and you, it's you know it, you, it's a matter of it serves flow and pressure, um, and you just have to be careful. You know, you can't just you, there's a certain amount of pressure that you use when you do the injection. You're usually using the same. You use the same circulatory system that a body has. So it's once you access, which is through usually the carotid artery. Um, you know, you just circulate like like any blood circulates only you're using the fluid at that point. And you just have to be careful if you get into situations where there's blockages and stuff, you get swelling. So you have to be able to back off the pressure at certain times or add pressure at certain times. But that's, this is a pretty modern machine hmm. uh, that they still pretty much use today. That was- yeah, Champions this is from one of the well, from one of their later catalogs. Um, same this this one here is um, showing some of those the shipping containers you were talking about. This one is an aircraft engine uh, container down in the corner, and we see here there's a missile in this one. So they were um, uh, they had a contract with government for U.S. military missiles. Um, I know if, I don't know if Casey's still on right now, but I think we have. Um, uh, I'm here. Okay. Uh, the contain the shipping containers that we have in the collection. I meant to ask you more about that today. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're talking about um, aren't, aren't they from? I'm Champion? not aware. I'm not aware that we have any champion shipping containers in the collection. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I don't. I don't think we have any. Okay. Okay. I know that we had done um, one, a few years ago. Um, we were doing uh, several Born in Clark County exhibits uh, throughout the year, and we did a, a larger exhibit on Champion Chemical. And they had um, they brought in a, a lot of stuff that they they let us uh, scan and and save that um, we borrowed for the for the length of the exhibit, like um, some uh, different factory photos. We've got some um, filling bottles here. Um, and some some of the different products they had. Yeah, before they went to the embalming machine, they used gravity bottles, in which they'd mix the fluid up into a a, a container, and as and they would raise it up on a on a rope to, towards the ceiling. And there's a there's a formula, and I don't know what it is, but it's you know volume times height, and it, it would create so much pressure when they embalm the body at home. Before they had embalming machines, they they used all gravity bottles back then. Which, and, and Champion made those also, because there were a lot of films that used those that didn't go to the uh, to the machines until later. This is uh, one of the next slide is there we go. Um, it shows them testing the vaults uh, <laughs> by dropping them off uh, a cliff at Clifton Gorge uh, here, uh, just down the road. Uh, so they're they're showing. Yeah, how, how indestructible they were. Huh. And Marty, you might recognize somebody on this next slide. Yes, indeed. The gentleman up there on the upper right there. That's my dad in his lab. Huh. Yep. And he was quite the, uh, quite the man of, of science and, and health. He took that very seriously. And I think, and, and Jack, you probably know from interacting with him, one of the things that he did as director of service and research, besides his work on the on the chemicals and the glutaraldehyde and all that, the the, the champion encyclopedia, expanding encyclopedia, uh, which they sent out to the funeral homes, made available information about techniques and processes, right. answered questions. And my dad used to travel around 
to almost all the mortuary schools around the country. And he would give lectures on uh, the health aspects of this. Obviously, there's a, there's a whole issue of embalming and care of the dead, for comfort for the family, for saying goodbye, for transition and all of that. But there also were, as you were just discussing about the, the health aspects, certainly from the Civil War, of dealing with uh, decaying bodies and all that. But the whole idea of, of, of treating not only the dignity of the deceased, but also ensuring the health, both of the people doing the work, the embalming work, and also others who would interact uh, with, with, the, with these bodies. So he, he took it very seriously. And also when he, when he went out to these schools, it wasn't just to promote champion, it was about really promoting and sharing the state of the art information about this, the science and the health of it. So there's a whole other aspect of this just besides fluids. Right. It, they, well, when we were in school, I mean, of course, the primary purpose of the embalming once we got there was basically it kills bacteria. That was the number one purpose right. of the embalming was to kill the bacteria, which kept the spread of disease down. So that was its number one purpose because that was very important back then. Um, and then the second second part of it was the preservation of the body was, was probably secondary. Um, and then third, there's actually cosmetic uh, uh, per, um, parts of what they do, they and whether or not they're dyes that they put in the fluid, or they put in um, uh, humectants, which are moisturizers to to keep the body uh, from dehydrating the other way, because it, it they, you know it firms the body quite a bit, and they'll dehydrate if you over inject uh, these types of fluids. Um, so, and that's exactly the kind of stuff that 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 Lee Marty's dad you know developed and worked with, and to get to get that balance. Uh, but it was it was so important that um, to stop that that decomposition. The only way to do that is to mm -hmm. use the aldehydes or the glutaraldehydes to stop the the bacteria growth. So well, the, this next slide here shows a selection of some of the um, the different <clears throat> chemicals. Line. Yeah, that's the different product line. You know, different products. There's people that are jaundiced will use the different types of fluid. So there's, there's certain ones when a body is jaundiced that they'll, they'll want to use as opposed to someone that's emaciated that you want to use more, more moisturizers in or more humectants in, you know. And then they've got other ones that, you know, that need to have a stronger fluid for whatever reason, that if they're obese and that you need to saturate the tissue more, you need to have a very strong, they, they call it index back then, but indexes would be anywhere from maybe 18 index, which is a percentage of formaldehyde all the way up to maybe 50% index. Um, and so there's different purposes for all these different bottles that they have there. Uh, and it depends on, you have to analyze the deceased and see which, which chemical would work best for that deceased. So that's why they have a, a, pro, a different product line that they show there. It's not just one shoe, you know, mm -hmm. it's all. No. That These other some... picture looks like it's the, comp the compounding room, those, those vats up there. That looks like the compounding room of the Champion Company where they actually mix the, the product. Yeah, this is, and this is a modern photo um, that we had when we, when we mm -hmm. were doing the, uh, the exhibit a few years ago. Um, this is from the display in the lobby. Uh, we had a lot of their like uh, more current product line stuff and, and pictures of um, inside that we, we uh, I think Casey went out there to get um, and did a lot of talking with them to work on um, putting this together. And uh, a lot of the stuff was on loan from them um, that were different products. Yeah. That they had. Well, see there on the bottom left, if you go back there on the bottom left was would be one of those uh, gravity bottles. It's yeah. Down on that. On that oh, section. yeah. Um, but, you know, they would put a stopper in the bottom of that and they would add uh, they're all, they were all probably all etched with, you know, the amount of fluid as a, and you mix with water usually. Um, and then as you height, as you increase the height, the pressure would increase and you had to know your, your formula for that, you know, to be able to do that. But that's what that, that's exactly what that. Mm -hmm. And it's next, and that's right. next to one of the modern machines then is that right. with its back to it. Yeah. That's on, would have been facing out on the other side of the case. I don't think I got yeah. a picture of both sides. Yeah, but that, you're right. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, got some some factory photos here. Um, yeah, that's sprinkle metallic, um, and you can see the bottom, the lid on the one. I I don't know how many people 
course, we, over the years that have that worked there, when it, and a lot of the women worked in the interior part of the caskets with all the materials. It was all women that put the interiors in the caskets. And over the years, I mean, literally hundreds of people came through the funeral and said, I worked down there and I put these interiors in. But every once in a while, they, da they damaged these lids and they put them outside somewhere and kids got a hold of them and they would take them and put them in Buck Creek and they would, they would use them as canoes. And they would, you'd see these things found in, along the Buck Creek where the kids had taken them down and used them as their little boats when they were kids. I heard that story several times over the oh years. Oh my gosh. It was just the lids of those. And then Springfield Metallic was, like I said, they were, they were at the top of their field. Uh, they made all the different uh, dyes for, for these caskets. And so it, when they were in their heyday, they, like I said, they, they were the largest in the world. Um, and they, they eventually got bought out by a number of, of different companies. And the last one was ATO Corporation that, that bought groups of companies. And then, then they just uh, uh, sold pieces off over the years. And, and they ended up selling a lot of these dyes for caskets to their competitors. Um, and they were just, uh, it's a shame because it was, it was a huge company at one time. And Batesville, which is probably the biggest one in the world now, but they bought a lot of those uh, products that they, you know, the dyes for these caskets, and they still use them today. Those round in corners that are on the bottom left, those are those are difficult to make. Um, and Champion, I mean, uh, Sprint Metallic um, developed all these different sh shapes and sizes of caskets, different materials, you know, whether or not they're 20 gauge, 18 gauge, stainless steel, copper, bronze, they made everything down there um, and you know they they sent them to all over the world for you know the world leaders presidents they, they were all buried in in a metallic sprinkle metallic caskets in the day so well uh, their their as far as their history goes they started in 1884 and have that they closed in 1974 so they didn't quite make um a hundred years there um but that building now that the Part of the complex is is um, uh, Mother Stewart's Brewery is the next next door to the so that the other building still the main building hasn't been developed or used is it that's the the back building um, that faces on North Street uh, but their their administrative offices are where the Hatch Artist Studios are now in the in the front there right I think I got a couple of these slides uh, I, I, I there's a this this trade show one I, I move that one too far up the metallic casket one but the um this one goes back to champion showing them at um showing their where is it a, a trade show and jack had asked you a little bit about these um uh, funerary uh trade shows is this still the norm for yeah. showcasing products yeah and ohio ohio had one of the large they were usually uh, state conventions the state ohio funeral directors convention would have them every year and champion always set up and, and so did Springfield Metallic. Um, any, any industry that, that served the funeral uh, industry would be set up there. And they, they were huge. Uh, they'd be at the larger convention halls. And, it would, and they're exactly right. They set up exactly like that. They still do this today. Um, and they're still fairly large. Ohio has, there's a, there's a national uh, that moves around the country. But from what I've heard, Ohio is, is, is almost as large as the national. Um, convention so and they're they're always in columbus the ohio's is they used to have it in cincinnati once in a while but uh they have it every year now in columbus at the convention hall downtown so and it's you know they have hearses and you know embalming tables and just about anything products the sundries part of it the register books and you know urns now because of cremation being such and the crematories the companies come in and set up and so it's, it's really, it's hard to get into, <laughs> but, but it's interesting to get in and walk around. I've taken friends over once in a while and they're amazed by some, you know, some of it is really, it's really interesting to, to, to walk through one of these conventions if you've never done it. So, I can, ima I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. Uh, it, this it, is some of, some more uh, things that were in the, the photos. Uh, again, I might've mixed these up. But this, I thought this was still part of Champion, but uh, products that they made as far as, you said this one was an earth mover um, on the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they dig the grave and throw the soil in there and then you can be able to dump it easier and keep it off the ground. And I assume that, I mean, that was more um, 
services to, to cemeteries. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the machine on the right is that would deliver the vault. It would be on there. And there's there's a hoist on that that would lift. Well, you can see the vault on the right, barely on the right. I'm, I'm blocked off on a little bit of that picture. So um, anyway, you know, they just would use a, a hoist and set that vault down on top. There's a base that usually goes in the bottom of the grave. And then when they set these steel vaults like that, they would come down and clamp over the top. And we actually clamp to the bottom of the base. And that would secure that, you know, for back then it was grave robbers, but now it's just mostly they sell it for moisture more than anything. But I'm not sure there's really any true purpose of that anymore. But uh, there are still people that want waterproof vaults today. And most of the, most of the cemeteries around here, uh, there's one in particular that's probably in a floodplain that's not the greatest, but, um, you know, Ferncliff's all hills and gravel. And so they don't have really water issues over there. Uh, areas that are flat, you know, you, you dig a grave and an hour later, it might be full of water, you know, so they've got to figure out a way of getting that vault down into that grave, pump it out, get a grave in there and get it buried before it starts actually floating back up to the top. <laughs> so there's, they've had issues of that over the years of people that actually put cemeteries in where they should have never, never put them in. Uh, but Ferncliff is, is and, and usually the ones around town here close by, um, but there's a couple in the county. Glen, Glen Haven, isn't it, in a flood zone? Yes, it is. I wasn't going to say which one it was, but yeah, there, it's. That's where my family's at. Out. Yeah, when we go out there, it's uh, certain areas of it are really bad, and they're, they're pumping water out of, as we pull in with the hearse. They're mm -hmm. pumping the grave out, you know. It's not a good feeling when you're, as a funeral director or a family member, pulling in mm -hmm. and you're seeing that. So that's when some people say, you know, I'd like, I want to make sure I have a waterproof vault. That's, that's probably the reason why, because they've mm -hmm. seen that before. Or trying to walk to the grave and you're walking in six inches of water. Yeah. You know, so, but that's, those, those are all service to the cemeteries, these two items here. Well, and then uh, here's my more metallic casket. Um, this is up in front of the, so this is the, still the door that faces out on, um, uh, well, we've got Columbia there, whatever that little street is that runs alongside the, the main building. The uh, uh, I can't, yeah, I can't think of what that little street is in between, uh, but this is the door that faces out there, and you can see that the, the awning part is off now, but they still have the, the same door. Um, and if you go around to the to the side, that's where the entrance to the the Hatch Artist Studios is now. Yeah, when I got out of school, that Springfield Metallic had a showroom, and and a lot of the almost all the funeral homes used their showroom to bring families down. So we would pick families up, drive them down to Springfield Metallic, and we'd go in that door, and there's a stairway down to the left, and there was there's a huge room down there, and they would have all their all their caskets on display, and it was kind of nice for the local guys because if somebody came in and said, "Well, I really like," this casket, but I like this color or this interior, you could call upstairs to the guys in the shop and they'd run that through for them for the families. Uh, it was really kind of nice for the families that we served and for us too. But, and then as they closed up, that's when most of the other people started putting in their own showrooms and, you know, having to bring caskets in from different companies. And that was, well, I think we built, built a showroom probably around 73 or 74 when, when you said they closed up so that, um, Roger Sasson, there was a guy that was their head of sales down there, um, was probably the last person that we dealt with over the years. Um, but he, he, was, he was there when they shut everything down and they started selling, selling it off piece by piece. It was, it was really too bad because they, they made a great product. It was, it was quality all the way. So. Well, this is another picture that shows the the complex. This is a Google uh, view, and I thought this is a good the the cemetery here. Um, this was a picture from one of their their show, photos showing the um, the uh, company there in the background. So this is this is later after they had closed, but this is the um, if Bob's still on the um, on this call. Uh, Bob Holzeiser, he was part of the uh, cemetery uh, restoration committee. And I was wondering if that if that stone is still in a in that tree like that out there. Um, this is one of the pictures that they had in their in their collection of stuff, uh, hmm. metallic yeah, casket that showed. Up. Uh, but you showed this. Here's the administrative building down here, and then um, I'm not sure. I mean, if the, if this is just open, 
Um, I think some of it's used for storage, but um, otherwise there's not any development happening back in there right. in the main building. And then uh, Casey got to uh, a lot and several people in town. I don't know if any of you, the rest of you got to go on that Forbidden City tour um, that was back in 2011, but Casey got to go um, and got a lot of um, interior photos um, throughout the building because that was one of the buildings people got to go to. So here's just a couple of shots. Okay. Hmm. Um, so, and then some of their um, pictures from some of their catalogs. Yeah, that that's pretty the casket there. Oh, and that's the same picture I had in the other one. Uh, slide was woman. Yeah, working on the yeah. interior there. Huh. They're great pictures. And then they're shipping. They're shipping to funeral other funeral homes in it. Mm-hmm. That's a casket. Well, that would be probably it's sprinkled metallic still. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is their loading dock area. Um, uh, yeah, I was, you know, they, of course, we just order a casket right from them. They just bring it right out to us on a single truck. They wouldn't box it up. Didn't have to. But I, yeah, you know, so close by. Yeah. They probably shipped a lot by rail back then and they had to kind of protect those. So. Why they ship put them in the shipping can uh, the shipping boxes there? Yeah, uh, this is the last ones I have as far as the um, the two companies here, and then I have um, put in some pictures um, related to different funeral homes in the area. That we've got pictures of in the collection. Uh, this one today you can see down in the in the bottom right. Um, it's Jones Kenny Zeckman. Uh, it's now all white. Uh, I know this is a black and white photo, but I, I believe from the photo, it's, it was probably, it was not an all white building at the time. Um, and if you look at it, I meant to put in a, the modern picture today. Um, you know, they've got the awnings and the black roof and I believe the porch is gone. Um, but uh, it's, it was originally the home of um, Elijah C. Middleton. Um, and we tell a story about him in the, in the galleries. Um, his son, Edward Middleton, uh, was to be a uh, supposed to be a bugler in the Civil War, uh, and he he went off to war, and then um, you know they were shorthanded, so the the two young boy ended up um, being uh, uh, supposed to be serving. His father wrote to Abraham Lincoln uh, and asked him to be released, and he said, "When evidence shall be brought to me with this paper that the father has procured uh, a replacement, I will release the son." Uh, so this is our, our Lincoln letter that we have um, uh, there for, uh, and Middleton later was, uh, uh, spent some time in Andersonville prison, but was later released and returned home. And he lived at, at this home, his father, the family was the first owners here, uh, built in 1870 uh, for um, Elijah Middleton and Edward lived there. So um, it became the funeral home in, uh, I think it was originally, uh, Joseph O'Brien funeral home in 1928. O'Brien, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Kenny yeah. were his nephews, and they took over in 1936, and it became O'Brien Kenny. Um, and then, and today it's Jones Kenny Zeckman. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ray Ray was the last nephew to be there, and he actually worked. He wasn't a funeral director, but he ran it. He always had to hire, you always had to have a licensed funeral director if you owned a funeral home. So he had to hire a licensed funeral director. There's two licenses, funeral directors and embalmers. You, you have to have both uh, to run a funeral home. So Ray worked at actually at Wright Path um, and he kept the funeral home because it was in the family and, and ran it on the side. And then uh, when he retired from the field, he finally uh, sold it to uh well, there was a guy by the name of Tom Jones that had a funeral home for a while out on the, on South Limestone. And then I think Tom might have, I'm trying to think if Tom came into this building for a few years and then sold to Lynn, sold to Lynn Zeckman maybe. But uh, then Lynn came in and, and Lynn's been there ever since. Lynn does, does a great job. So is Zeckman the only name still associated with that one? Yeah. Officially, and his daughter. Yeah, he has a daughter that's licensed film director also, and and they they do a great business down there. They serve the public well. Another one that um, a lot of people recognize today is the um, 
on, on North Limestone, Littleton Funeral Home, but it started out on um, South Limestone. Um, and um, I believe the house, yeah, the house is still standing um, down by, or the, the church that's down there on South Limestone. I can't think, the church is abandoned now too. I can't remember what it was last. Um, but then um, they were at 420, and then they were at 414, which is the one that you see in the in the picture down here. And then they moved to um, up to North Limestone um, in um, 19. Well, uh, moved up there in the 30s. And then um, so a lot of people know the little um, uh, little child's little, little oh. child. Yeah, the little the little house. Uh, sorry, the I can't. Couldn't think of the word um, that's off to off to the um, on the grounds out there. A little child's playhouse, yeah. The playhouse. Yeah, that's been there since my mom was a child and lived up the street. Yeah. So. And when I was originally doing research for this, I found out that the the memorial clock on Recitation Hall is the H. A. Littleton Memorial uh, clock after it. Um, oh. uh, Jack, is that particular house the one that's associated with Jonathan Winters and his family? It is. It, it is. It was lived there um, at one time for a while. I think. At one time, it was, it was uh, yeah. his mother's family's home, I believe. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. The uh, I think he spent some time there as a boy. He moved around between Dayton and Springfield, and then of course went off to seek his fortune. But as I recall, his family had connections to that property. Yeah, I've always heard that over the years too. Yeah, he referred to it a few times on TV. I know. Grown up some in Springfield, Ohio. Hmm. And then uh, another one um, that is today, I think this is a staffing uh, uh, place yeah. now out yeah. on, on, on East High. Um, but this was originally um, C.F. Jackson's uh, funeral home, um, which is today um, Jackson Lytle up on way up on North Limestone. Um, and I think and he started been, on South South End somewhere also. Jackson did years ago before he bought this property. Um, and then another one that we don't have a picture of the funeral home in the archives, but um, C.M. Patterson um, um, was very active in the Black community. And he actually got his degree um, at the Clark School of Embalming in Cincinnati. So that must yeah. be Joseph Clark's school then. Yeah, um, and he got... Yeah. he. Um, he graduated from there in 1916 um, and then came to Springfield to start the funeral home. So he was instrumental. Uh, there was, this is a picture here um, at the turn of the century. There was um, a race riot in 1904 um, and a police officer was killed and a uh, black man was killed by mob and retaliation. Um, and there was another one uh, race riot a couple of years later. And C.M. Patterson had, um, who had been, um, uh, instrumental in the black community. He was uh, helped with the um, raising money for the, the Center Street YMCA and um, uh, was the, the longtime funeral director. He uh, was helped to organize an effort to stop anything like that from happening again. Um, that if, you know, future, future riots like that um, by banding together with some other um, fellow undertakers that were on the south side um, and a local attorney, uh, Sully James, and they helped to raise money um, to help uh, get weapons and train uh, people um, among the black community to prevent this from happening in the, in the future. In the, in the 20s, when there was another kind of spark that was seemed to be leading towards something, they were able to, to stop anything from um, leading to another. Um, the first two had ended up uh, burning down two of the majority black uh, neighborhoods in the area. So we don't, we have a couple of like products related to him in his funeral home, but we didn't have any pictures of it. Um, but we do have a couple of pictures of him that where he shows up in um, some group photos. So is that uh, John that, Patterson? Is, that, is this John that you're showing? Uh, this is uh, Chatfield Patterson here. Okay, because there was a John also that was in the Yeah, movie. I think that that was, that was a family member. That was, um, it remained in the family. Okay. Um, so I think that might have been a son. There, there's a story Something right now uh, uh, years ago when... Um, hey, Chuck. Hello? Oh. Um, anyway, um, Mr. Patterson went down. Of course, they did 
they had a lot of indigence through the black community back then. They didn't have the money to be able to bury it. And John Patterson came back, came down to the, to the local city government, the commissioners and said, you know, I need help. You know, we're, we're doing more than our share of, of families that can't, can't afford to be buried and, and I'm taking care of them all. And, and basically the government, the community leaders at that time said, you know, that's just too bad. That's, that's the nature of things and you're on your own. So he just said, okay, that's fine. So because the next one I get, I'm gonna bring down, I'm gonna put it on city hall steps. And he said, I'm leaving it here and I will not be back for it. And he says, it'll be your problem then, not my problem. So I think that same afternoon, they voted to come up with this indigent burial program. So John Patterson was instrumental in, in getting the city to take responsibility for, for the homeless people and the indigent people back then that, that the black, black community and the white community too, but more the black had a bigger burden of, um, of bearing uh, you know, their community. And, and it, was, it was not fair. And so he forced the issue <laughs> and they addressed it really pretty quick after that, which was, you know, my dad thought an awful lot of John Patterson. I, he, was, you, he was quite a community leader. Do you know when that, when that was? Uh, um, it had to be, I'm going to, well, yeah, it had to have been in the 50s. In the 50s. Okay, because this was about, you know, third, his, so this must have been his, uh, I'll thing. have to, I say either grandfather or father, I'll have to look that up, because I knew John Patterson, it was, it remained in the family, but I wasn't sure what the lines were, um, but that's really interesting, I did not know about that. Yeah, because no, he was older than my dad, and so, you know. Um, uh, Marianne, I think, has a comment, or has, do you know more about that? Yeah. Well, I'm, I was trying to get on, but I don't know, I guess I'm on after all. Um, I just wanted to tell you, Patterson Funeral Home was on South Fountain Avenue when uh, about 1949-50 era, uh, when I was in high school, and the house still sits where he had a funeral home there. Really? Huh. The, anyway, when, when we were in school, that was the Patterson Funeral Home on South Fountain, in about the 700 block of South Fountain. Near to near, uh, real close to the Baptist Church there. Oh, okay. The, and it was on the west side of the street. On so the you might side. look it up in uh, some of your uh, address. Uh, Nineteen. Files. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'll check and check the directories to get yeah. the address on that one. Hmm. And then uh, another one that is very well known. Um, originally, the governor's mansion, uh, Asa Bushnell's home on um, on East High Street. Uh, it became um, Roscoe Austin Richards. Uh, he uh, became a uh, master registered embalmer in 1913 and um, started out with Jackson Kaufman on West High. Uh, and then um, in 1939, uh, he invested $19,000 to buy the governor's mansion uh, and turn it into um, the funeral home that it is today. Uh, he later partnered with uh, Richard Raff, um, and I'm not sure the Dunbar, um, at least not yeah, in our historical for, records. Yeah, Rick worked for the, both of them when he was in school. Rick's about my age, and he took it over when Fred died. He, bu he bought it, which probably was in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, right. somewhere around in there. So, yeah, Mr. Richards was from down southern Ohio, and... Of course, all the Southern, there's a lot of Southern Ohio people that moved up here to work at Navistar. And they were very loyal to, to uh, Mr. Richards. And, and he helped my dad get started actually, which was unusual. Uh, so I know yeah. that he was also the county coroner. That's what my question that I have. How does that work? I mean, to be the coroner, but also running your own funeral home. I, he was voted in. He was voted in as coroner. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't have to be a doctor years ago. They, doctors didn't want to do it. And funeral directors had more uh, knowledge about death at the time. Um, so somehow he got, he got appointed to start with and then was elected full term. And he was, he was the actual coroner for, for quite a few years when I first yeah, got over it. Over 30 years. It's a, yeah. uh, he was. So there was a little bit of conflict of interest there. <laughs> he'd go out on calls and they'd you know, of course, I know a funeral home that could serve you well, and then he'd recommend his own funeral home. But he was, he was a good guy. I mean, I, you know, he was well-respected. And uh, most of those guys that, that bought these properties, especially in the 30s, um, 
you know, it was, it was out of the depression and most of them had been sitting empty for years because uh, their owners, you know, were dead or bankrupt. And so they bought them for, you know, 10 cents on the dollar to buy these properties. And it, uh, they're, they're amazing properties, but they're expensive to keep up, you know. I well, have I thought... a connection with uh, Austin Richards and um, I, I want to tell you just a quick girl story on this. He, he went to his uh, safe, which was in his office where they have the office now. And he got out a box and he showed me he had records of all the deeds from the time that uh, when he originally bought the property, he said it went clear down to Buck Creek and had all kinds of acreage along with the house. And uh, he had uh, records of all those deeds and everything. I don't know what happened to it because I asked uh, Fred Rath later on about it and he didn't seem to know anything about it and neither did uh, Dunbar. So I don't know what happened to those records when uh, Austin died, but he had a box of files that would have been very important to have, uh, for somebody to have had, you know. Yeah, because it's probably, they may be gone now because when Rick retired, um, he sold to a firm out of Atlanta. So there's a, it's a firm out of Atlanta that owns that funeral home now. Um, yeah, but Rick didn't know about it at the time. Uh, I had told him about my, my story about uh, uh, Austin Richards showing me those things. And I told him exactly where it was in the office where this big safe stood and everything, but he, he had no recollection of it. So um, hmm. I, I don't know what happened to it. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about it. I used to spend the night up there with, with Fred's son, he had a son, John, uh, who ended up being a Presbyterian minister. And Fred and my dad were friends and they'd always, well, why don't you go up and see Johnny and spend the night and, you know, so he, they'd spend the night at my house up over our funeral home and we'd spend, I'd spend the night up there. You know, it was creepy back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figured the last few slides, you could tell us a little bit about the history of uh, Conroy. Oh, okay. You know, well, home. of course that's my grandfather. Um, and he, like I said, he, from what we can figure out, he graduated mortuary school uh, under Clark back in 1906. So he had to be like 15 years old um, and then did that traveling for a while. But then he ended up coming and starting out down here on Lagunda Avenue um, about the 900. Well, that's 669. But I don't I think these addresses have changed because I think I think St. Bernard's is in the 800 block now. But um I, we never could figure out where he came up with the money to, to open up and buy these cars. But this this is a, an ad that was in the paper that the Springfield newspaper put out when he opened up down there. And he was down there until uh, probably in the late 20s or early 30s. And he ended up moving from there up onto East High Street uh, next door to, well, our building is, part of our building is on this property, but he bought this property up there. And put the funeral home in up there and the neighbors uh, on both sides of him filed a lawsuit against him. Um, it was zoned properly, but they didn't want, they thought having a, a a funeral home in the neighborhood was very depressing to the neighbors and they didn't want anything to do with it. And they took him to court and he actually went to the Ohio Supreme Court and he lost uh, <clears throat> his case and they forced him out of the neighborhood uh, of that property. He kept the property <coughs> Ended up moving over to um, North Limestone and he bought the Edward Wren home. Um, and he, that was, yeah, that he bought that property and it was, it was empty at the time. Um, and so he developed that into the funeral home. And once he found out that he was going to be established there, he went back to that property where he was kicked out of and he built like an eight car garage on the property line, right down the neighbor's <laughs> property line, that they had no view of anything coming out of their back door. He was a real spiteful German. And so, uh, so he was, he was here. My dad joined him after the service um, and became Con Dagenhart Conroy Funeral Home. And then I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but grandpa died in 55 and my dad left the business and ended up buying the property right next door to where my dad or my grandfather got kicked out of. Yeah, he ended up, he had, he had like $4,000 and he bought this property. Uh, and, and the property right next door is the people that, that had filed a lawsuit against him. They were all long gone and dead. Um, so it's funny, but 
we ended up right next door to where he got kicked out. It was just out of a chance. So that's the funeral home, what it looked like when dad bought it, uh, the postcard on the bottom right. And uh, people by the name of Parrish lived next door in that, in that tile roof house. And they had, this guy had developed to determine the sex of an egg, believe it or not. And that's how he made his money. Uh, he sold this patent because he could determine the sex of an egg before it was hatched and made a lot of money. And, and they bought this house and then he started selling a tire business out of that place. He had tires stored everywhere in that property. There was big barns behind it. We had horse stables. When we moved into this house, there was a big horse stable in the back. Um, it wasn't a practical building at the time, but- uh, Funeral director? What's that? I oh, some I I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, dad had the barn back there for four or five years and finally was able to make enough money that he could take it down and put a, a garage up to store the cars in. Um, we never had any of the horses or anything, but the stable was always back there. And it was, you know, growing up as a kid, you didn't really see all that it was old history, but it was pretty neat at the time. So, and then we put this first edition came on in, uh, I think I was a senior in high school. And so been 1968, we put this first edition on. And then uh, I think it was in 91, we put the, a second edition on, on the front. So, uh, so this is today. Right. Right. Yeah. So this one was night, the, the one to the right looking at it is 91. The yeah. And that's where the people lived that, well, that's where the, that's where the first funeral home was when he got booted out by the neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's right where that, that addition, the people that lived there, he, that grandpa had that building and, the, and then on the other side of that big tree is the people that started the, the lawsuit against him. Um, and it, it all worked out, you know, I mean, it's funny how things work out in the long run. He was, he was pretty upset about it at the time, but he ended up on North Lyme and the Edward Wren home, which is, which was a pretty neat home. And in fact, when dad, this is a pretty neat story. When dad uh, got out of the service, he went to mortuary school on the, during the week and we'd come home and work on weekends. And it was a, they were dirt floors in that Edward Wren home and dad, grandpa wanted to pour cement down there so he could use it for something. And so he had my uncle and my dad go down there and start cleaning it out. And there was, there was bricks in the, in the floor that he wanted taken out. And he took out, he took out a row of bricks and there was another row of bricks. So it was a stairway and dad dug down as he was down there, he kept digging down and, and there was a stairway in the basement going down below the basement level. And he, he just kept, you know, kept going. I don't know how deep they got, but grandpa came back and said, what are you guys doing? I told you to get this ready. They're going to pour this basement. And they said, well, we found this stairway. We want to know where it went. He goes, I don't care where it went. He said, fill that hole in, get it ready. We're pouring cement. And that's what they did. They poured a cement floor over that. So I don't, we don't know if that was part of the underground railroad at one point, um, or if it was a wine, I mean, it couldn't have been as simple as a wine cellar, but nobody ever, ever figured out what was below that, um, that the basement floor of the Edward Wren home on, on North, North Limestone. So, but I always thought that was kind of an interesting story. I told um, the, the guys that are in the construction company, Laughlin Scanlon's in it now, I guess, Scanlon's in it. I've told him that a couple of times since he didn't know anything about it either. So. Yeah, let's see, yeah. We'll have, to, we'll have to see if we can get a tour figure it out someday. An old Irishman built that, of course, Edward Wren. He was, he was from Ireland. And if you go look around it, uh, 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 right between the first and second floor, there's a, a row of concrete in there, stone, and there's shamrocks that they that had etched in the, the outside of that building. You'd, you'd never notice it unless you go over and take a look at it. But they are, as an Irishman, he put shamrocks all around the outside of that building. So if you get a chance- go over to go um, over to the speedway and check that out sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really neat. Mm -hmm. Well, now we've come to the part where uh, we can we can just do a, a, a general Q and A, I think, for you. Or if you have any anything else you want to add, uh, Nat can... Natalie, if I, this is, I want to mention while you're talking about the funeral directors, one who's of interesting historical importance is Robert Henry. Because Robert mm -hmm. Henry in 1966 was the first African-American mayor of Springfield, and he was a funeral director. Jack probably knows more about him than I do, but uh, I thought yeah. that's kind of an interesting footnote there. 
he was the first mayor of any major city in the, in the country. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I remember that's right. All, you know, homes. I've got in fact I took a picture out to, to Bob, Bob Henry, young Bob at the time. But there was a picture of all the funeral home funeral directors went out to the Springfield Airport and they put him on a plane. He was getting on a plane to fly to Washington for some reason. It was some kind of major mayors of the country, and Springfield was considered a major town back then. And they all sent him off. They were there to wish him well to send Bob off. And, uh, he took a lot of grief yeah. over the years being in that position, um, but right. he, he was quite a guy. But it was a big deal at the time. I remember to have an African American as the mayor right. of the city, and mm-hmm. I think he was appointed. And then I think you know, Mayor Stokes in Cleveland, I think, got elected the next year. Something kind of took some of the thunder away. But uh, Mayor Henry was our pride. Yeah, and, and a good good mayor, really. Mm-hmm. And I've forgotten that he was also a funeral home director that, that, yeah. that funeral yeah. home. Yeah, you know, home's still there, the boys still and run. still on the south, yeah. yeah and that's still family, there. is it still family run? Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. And the, 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 Portis, children run it. the Port of Squall, is that one, that's also one on the south side. That yeah, Vinny Porter ran that for years and he had a nephew that was Porter in a while and he had some issues, so he's not there anymore. And a, actually a professor down at Wilberforce or right, or, uh, Central State. I can't remember wh- where he teaches, but he ended up buying that funeral home. Uh, he wasn't. He's not licensed, but he hired funeral directors to run it. And and so, uh, yeah, Porter Qualls is still out there, but Qualls is out of it. Porter's out of it. And there's a. I, know, I think he's a some type of minister that taught down at, at one of the black universities, or either Wilberforce or Central State. I don't remember which one. And then they they've hired a couple funeral directors, so they've got a license. You know on the on the wall down there so and another one that we talked about the other day the woods algier uh used to be on um algier sorry um yeah. used to be on uh north limestone where the um well patty's pizza was uh, last in that location right uh, yeah yeah um mr yeah uh woods alfred woods had it uh, you know, from before I was born. And he was friends with my grandfather because he was up the street. They were only, you know, two blocks from each other. So they were pretty good friends. And then uh, Jack Allgaier came in and took it over and they worked together until Mr. Woods died. He was really a classy guy, Mr. Woods. And then uh, Jack's son took it over and had some problems uh, later in life and, and uh, ended up taking his life. And, uh, and it closed up suddenly one day. Uh, and it was a shame. They, it was a, you know, it'd been around longer than me. And so, you know, I, I don't know. I, don't, I think when John Algar passed away, it was probably, probably 20 years ago, maybe now, I assume, if, since it's been closed. So that when that closed suddenly when, when that happened. So I'd, I'd like to go back to Bob Henry for a minute. Uh, Jack, you mentioned about him uh, going to Washington and uh, on a special thing. He was appointed, uh, I think there were only five or six people uh, on this committee, but he was appointed to a special um, committee to represent the United States to go over to South Vietnam and visit with them to help them get uh, reorganized over there. And he made two trips over there. Uh, One uh, I, I can't remember what year it was. It was in the 50s, I think, um, or maybe, anyway, late 50s, maybe. And they, he went back like two years later. And, and when he went to the, the, there the first time, he told the mayor, at, I think it's Saigon, maybe, um, that uh, we were talking about putting a fountain on the Esplanade and he told him all about it because he was really encouraging our beautification committee to work on that. And uh, he said when he went back on the second trip, they had a beautiful fountain like he had described in front of their city hall. And he said it was probably paid by United States money. I I vaguely remember him taking that trip. I do. Yeah. Yeah, he was on a special committee and it was because he was a black mayor and the mayor of a, a significant size city so yeah it, it was good for the city bob did a good job great yeah. job really. so jack i have a question for you about just the the funeral home uh like community yeah. um uh, that uh, it's it's 
I mean, throughout history and everything that we have in our archives, everything is passed down through families. And right. that seems to be generally the norm for most funeral homes in history. It used to be. But yeah, so so what what does that mean for for the the field going forward if if it, things aren't passed down through families? Is there are there people enough people staying in the field? Well, I mean, the school's still open um, in Cincinnati, and and they've moved out um, north of town. So they, I mean, they're still, you know, producing licensed funeral directors. Uh, and actually, there's a lot more female, I think, now than there were our male students in the in the in the school. I don't know, um, you know, how many of them stay in it once they graduate. Women, it's you know, there's a lot of physical part to it. Of lifting people out of upstairs and you know removals of, of deceased bodies that are big, so it's it's very difficult sometimes to have the strength to do that. But but there are certainly qualified women um, like Jackson Lytle. Um, when Jackson Lytle owned it, you know Art Lytle owned it, and then he sold it. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, and I can't think of it right off the name. I'm drawing a blank. Um, but then he's when he sold out. Um, he sold to a big corporation out of Houston, Texas. It was the SCI Corporation. So a corporation bought that. And then one of the corporate guys came in and bought five or six, they call it a pod back then. He bought five or six of these funeral homes and, and, and went into business for himself. And he bought, uh, he bought Jackson Lytles. He bought Walters in Urbana. He bought the Yellow Springs. He bought um, uh, England Williams in South Charleston. He owned, he owned all this, uh, Frank Lewis did. And he's now just in the process. And in fact, I think it happened within the last month or so, he sold the business again uh, to one of his employees, a, a woman, uh, Frankie Bennett's her name and her husband. So they've, they've sold again in the last month or so. So, you know, that's been in and out of corporations. Like I told you before, Richards is in a corporation uh, now out of Atlanta. Um, trying to think. Of course, Littleton's is, is family owned. Rob's over there and, and Rob Campman's over there and John Detling. Those guys are, and they do a good job over there. So they're, you know, they're locally owned and operated, which I always, I, to me, I, I hope people realize it's, it's a local business. The money stays here when you deal with local people, you know, and then of course we're local. We've been around, and, you know, with my boys are fairly young still, so they'll be around. Um, but it's changing, you know, um, with COVID, things have changed a lot. I mean, it, we were always moving a little bit more towards cremation, but uh, COVID has probably pushed that along a little bit quicker. We probably do 50%, a little over 50% cremation. Um, so the industry is changing um, a little bit that way. Um, there's good and bad to that. You know, families used to always get together. Weddings and funerals was where they got together. And now we, you know, we get people that, oh, you know, we're going to do cremation. We're not going to do services. And, you know, it's kind of here today, gone tomorrow. So, um, you know, families aren't getting together like they used to, and, and, and they're spread out so much anymore that it's just a different different industry and family structure is so much different today than it used to be. Um, so eventually, probably it'll narrow down to two or three funeral homes altogether, probably. So, you know, they could have enough uh, income between the three businesses. But the ones that are here are pretty well established right now. There's a couple of them have been sold, bought and sold over the last two years, really. Several of them have been sold. And, you know, I, I expect probably over the next few more years, you'll see more of that, that, that some of these places will either close up or be sold out to somebody else. Jack, so, was the other name you were thinking about, Jackson Lytle Kaufman? Kaufman? No, well, well, Kenny Kaufman was one. He came out of Yellow Springs originally. Um, no, gosh, I can see his face and I can't think of his name right off. Um, he died a few years ago, but he, he bought from... Art Lytle, and he ran it for maybe 10 years, maybe 10 or 15 years. He started out, he actually was up on, um, he was up on East High Street to start with. He bought a place next to um, the Frank Lloyd Wright house. There was a guy that bought, a, bought the building right next oh, door. Yeah. To yeah. And, and he put that funeral, he, he actually, there was a funeral home right next to the Frank Lloyd Wright house right. for probably five or six years, maybe. And he ended up buying it from Art Lytle. And okay. moving out there and closing that, and I just I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but um, yeah, I don't. That's how you know. That's I know that's the transition of that funeral home. It's just over the last forty years. You know, it's probably had three or four different owners. So, 
I couldn't remember anything between Jackson, Lyle Kaufman, and um, then Fred Raff <laughs> at that point. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know in our archives, it's like the banking history. Uh, I had I had Patty and I've had other volunteers go through and try and help me with the names changes and um, hands changing and all of that. So I know that our funeral home folders have lots of different names on them or added to them. And if you go through, you can you can find some of the history in there. So that's something hopefully we can continue, um, you know, keep uh, keep up with the ones we don't have much history on, get find more so that we can have all of them represented um, throughout the, the, the time periods. Um, but yeah, it's it's another one of those ones that's hard to hard to juggle the changes throughout time. Well, a lot of development yeah. of the industries was was here in Springfield, you know, at the turn of the century with Champion and Metallic, you know, and then with Clark being here for a while as far as the embalming side of it, they, you know, it, it was developed very strongly in this area. So, sure was. Do you have old city directories that you can check out? Uh, you know what the name of the funeral home was? At, in yeah. Between? Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that might be a, a future research project, maybe for a volunteer to go through and kind of uh, sketch all that out and uh, figure out more timelines on things um, like that. Yeah, I'll, it'll come to me as soon as we close up. I know that. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> Mac, I had a question. My father was a member of the uh, Springfield Lions Club, and I remember probably in the 80s or sometime that dad picked up eyeballs at the funeral home there at Algers on North Lime, and we drove them to Columbus for an eye transplant. Is that something that the funeral homes still do? Well, actually, that was that was me uh, that he oh. took. Um, yeah, I got certified in eye enucleation. Uh, and so when they started doing um, uh, cornea transplants, they taught funeral directors and and I was the only one here in Springfield that I went to Pittsburgh to, uh, and, and went and I took a training course. It was just a weekend thing. And it taught me how to remove the corneas out of, out of it. And that's when I joined the Lions Club and really got to know your dad better. And mm -hmm. the Lions Club helped support me in buying my instruments. So when someone would donate their corneas, I would go do the removal. And then I'd either have to put them on, it was the NBO, next bus out. <laughs> and it would take them to Columbus or wherever they needed them. And we'd ship them off to wherever was on the waiting list. And your dad picked them up a few times and, and did the transportation for me a couple of times. We'd pack I'm them in ice. Yeah, yeah, we'd pack, pack them in ice and send them out wherever they needed to. I still they, remember having a cooler in the back seat. Yeah. Driving yeah. That, that he would pick that up from me and we'd, we'd get it. So, yeah, I was the one who did that yeah. with your dad. Yeah. Oh, and I want to commend you and your whole organization. What your family has seen through the Spanish flu in 1918 through the COVID, you guys have had a burden not unexpected by anybody. So it had to be hard to face that day in and out. Yeah, it, it was difficult. The boys put up with it more than I did through the COVID part of it, you know. Um, and it's difficult because, I mean, it's a, it's a contagious, infectious disease. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, you have to be very, very careful when it, when the deal, then, you know, even though you're, you're embalming some of those bodies, some of the bodies didn't get embalmed. Um, and, and it was, you know, transmitted through saliva, you know, and, uh, not that they're breathing or coughing on you, but, you know, when you're picking them up and moving them around and, you know, uh, they're expiring air out of their lungs somehow, you know, you're at risk. Uh, so you take universal precautions and try to protect yourself as much as you can. The boys have all had it. Uh, you know, they're young enough and they fought it all, you know, um, and they've all had their shots and everything for it, but you got to be careful. But there's other diseases out besides just, you know, the COVID, you know, the Legionnaire's disease years ago. And uh, there's so many diseases that are very infectious and that people don't hear about. They come out of Ohio State for different reasons. Um, so there's, a, there's some, some real concern there. And so you got to know what you're doing but even whether or not you're doing a cremation or you're doing embalming or whatever, you're still dealing with that human body and you have to be trained to be able to deal with those, those bodies and still be able to deal with the public at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's, I mean, there's certainly a need going forward in our industry. It's just changing and you have to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Any, does anybody else have any other questions? 
going to say you. Oh, Marianne, you go right ahead. No, I, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with this. But when I left the museum today, uh, I forgot somebody had turned on the heater underneath that desk at the main place, and I'd never turned it on, and I never turned it off. And I'm worried about the the uh, uh, that uh, uh, little <clears throat> heater there. Can that cause any damage to the? I'll I'll double check before I leave, Marianne. Oh, I'll make sure it's not that's on. That's why I wanted to I'm, know. Were I'm here right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go check it out. Yeah, hey, please do. That'll that'll yeah. save me a little worry. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. I remember that guy's name. It's Jack Williams. Was his name? Williams. Okay. Jack Williams. Yeah. He's Jackson one of the Williams. Williams. That yeah. was a short time, oh, yeah. though, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't very long that he owned it. Yeah. And he yeah. sold out to this big corporation years ago. In fact, I think my cousin married his uh, son, and they didn't live here very long. And then she got divorced from him, I think. Was okay. there a son involved? Uh, you know. Uh, it was a son-in-law. It was a son-in-law. Uh, a son. Did he, he have a, did Williams have a son? I, you know, I don't remember him. I just remember the son-in-law, and he didn't last long. Okay. I don't remember a son. Though. I remember some kind of family connection, but I can't remember what it was now. I'm getting too old. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> In the club. Yeah. Well, Jane, my question was about, you mentioned that uh, that people were trending more towards choosing cremation. And I was wondering if you knew why that trend was growing or why people felt called to choose cremation over something maybe more traditional like embalming. Well, I, I think some of it has to do with family structure, that families have, mm -hmm. you know, the next generation has moved out of this community, a lot of it. You know, yep. my kids, I mean, I'm fortunate that two of my three kids live here, but most of them um, have left the community and they would have to come back. Um, finances are part of it. You know, financial is, is always a concern. So that drives it. Uh, COVID drove it because you couldn't, you know, they, they really encouraged us not to do public services um, during, the, during the high spell of, of COVID. And so we didn't, you know, and families got really upset. You know, they came in and we want visitation. We want viewing, we want to pay, have our, you know, and, and we said, you know, we can't, we're not, we're encouraged not to do that, you know, so, um, you know, we lost some business, and I think all the firms did because they tried to abide by what the the, the, the um, CDC was putting out, I guess, at the time to discourage that stuff. So that, that moved the needle a little bit. Now, we've seen it start to come back a little bit now. So we're starting to, some of those families that had left, there's just some families, once they get go to cremation, they never come back, and some that don't, aren't really ready to give up more of that traditional type service. Um, but, but it's, it's, you know, the idea of ha having a family service and to honor that person's life, I think, I think you lose a lot when you don't do something, you know, when we have people that come in and say, just, you know, mom died, go pick her up, cremate her, we're not going to do any services, she's gone, and that's, that's the end of it, you know, and there's, there's no respect given, I think it's just one more step towards lack of respect for, for mankind, you know, that's just, I think it's important that, I, I, I hate to see it swing that far, but some families, you know, have that approach to it. You know, it's just the easiest way out and the cheapest way out, no matter what. So you, you see some of that, you know, be, generation a year ago, people had savings, they had life insurance, they had money, they saved. Right. Today it's week to week, check to check. And, they, and families come in and say, you know, we want to do this, but oh, we don't have any money, you know? And so, well, this, this is what we can do. Of course, we're doing more city indigent cremations because people can't mm -hmm. afford it. And they just walk away from it. They said, well, I'm not going to be responsible. So they just walk, you know, so then we have to apply to the city and they give us, well, not even enough to cover our expenses, but they give us a, a small stipend, $850 to, to do the cremation. And that's, you can't do it for that amount, you know, so, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. If we keep trending towards that, uh, of the, of the, community having to provide services for all the deceased, I, something's going to have to change because the funeral homes can't afford to continue to pay for it out of pocket. And that's what they're doing at this point. They each take their share. And uh, so that's kind of where we are right now with that. We're looking at it. So, Jack, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. I have a, a little, little story now that we're getting close to Christmas. When I was 10 years old, it was uh, 1963, my, my grandmother was taking care of her brother 
and he died on Christmas morning, probably overnight. And so they shuffle us kids into the um, kitchen. And it was one of those houses that had the swinging doors, you all remember. Yeah. And we peeked out of it and we saw the body being taken out through the living room. And of course he was in a bag. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's Christmas day. And then Art Lytle uh, um, stayed, or maybe he came later, I don't know. And he and grandma were in the dining room making the arrangements. Yeah. Um, and we were literally in the next room opening our little, our packages, our presents. And my mom liked to take movies. You know, that was the time you took movies. The whole movies. And yeah. we literally have a movie With of <laughs> art leaving, coming through the dining room to the, out the door and waving to the camera. <laughs> so I always like to share that. Um, we're talking about the different individuals, but yeah. I just share it because what, you know, funeral directors do, yeah. there's, mm -hmm. there's no day off. No, there isn't. People don't realize the hours that sometimes we put yeah. in, they see us working the door, you know, greeting people and think that's all we do. But you now when you're working, you know, 365 yeah. days a year, 24 hours a day, right? Uh, somebody has to be on call, you know, yeah. and, and you got to be ready to, walk into a situation where somebody's died suddenly at home and, you know, families are upset. And Well, he had been sick. He had been sick for six years. My grandma and grandpa took him in and he was supposed to live for six months. And he lived for six years. And before, the year before he died, my grandpa died. Wow. So I imagine some of the discussion had already taken place. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting memory. <laughs> yeah, it's it's how it's things a, were was different. Yeah, it's not a negative memory, I hope. Yeah. No. I have another story about Bob Henry. I don't know whether I should tell it or not, though. Uh, it's about when he was city commissioner. And um, I used to go to the city commission meetings when it was in the old city hall, which is now your office area. But uh, anyway, uh, there was a night when they were discussing a new paddy wagon and, and uh, they wanted to purchase a new paddy wagon. And that was the, the vehicle that they picked up drunks and, and, you know, crooks and who knows what in. And uh, they wanted to know, they had an idea about getting a paddy wagon that had a TV monitor in it. And he raised the devil. He said, there's no way we're going to spend money for the city to provide a TV for these bad people. He said, they aren't first class citizens and they don't deserve a TV. And immediately the vote was against it. <laughs> yeah. He, he was wrong. quite a guy. I just, I love Bob Henry. He was a really wonderful person. Well, Jack. I really want to thank you for uh, for being here today. Um, if anybody has any other questions that you think of, you can send them to our. Um... Natalie, Natalie, I just want to before you sign off, oh, I just yeah. want to thank you and the Clark County Historical Society for all the incredible work you do. I'm I've been I'm not in Springfield anymore. I'm in Mahoboth Beach, Delaware, but I follow you, I follow you on Facebook, and I don't I don't get back to Springfield very often. But every time I go back, I always go to the to the to the historical society, to the building, the Heritage Center. And I love to see what the wonderful exhibits though. You're doing so much to, to cultivate the, the history, to keep the memories, to introduce new generations of people to Springfield, keeping that, that the wonderful traditions there. There's a lot of rich history in Clark County and you do a great job to, to steward that. One of the things I always enjoy when I go back to the museum is walking through that recreated downtown area, the models, you know, the, the Springfield, the late forties, whenever it's supposed to be, because I'm sure Jack remembers that too. When we were kids in the fifties, that's what the town looked like in downtown. Right now, it's you know, it doesn't look like that anymore. But it was, but all this interesting building. That's a beautiful thing to walk. It's like walk, literally walking down memory lane when you walk through that exhibit and you see the the uh, the buildings and all that used to be there. But everything else you do there to to uh, to cultivate the rich history. And I think the more as time goes by, the more I appreciate how really interesting the history of Clark County is. When you go back, you pick the century. You know, late 18th century, 19th, 20th. 
there's a lot going on there. A lot of interesting history. The architecture is quite outstanding. So much uh, has been contributed to the country out of, out of that part of, uh, of Ohio. So I think it's really important to, to, to preserve that. I love it that younger generations are, are, are investing in that, appreciating that. I think that this tonight, to be able to look at something like the funeral industry, a lot of people don't know how important that was in Clark County, the great role it's played over the years. To, to be able to bring that to life for us tonight has been a real treat. And also it's been an honor for me to be with my old friend and classmate, Jack Conroy and his wonderful family. They've done so much for the community over, over the decades uh, to provide comfort and assurance. And they're just wonderful civic leaders. And that's an honor to, to do anything with Jack Conroy. Well, thanks, Marty. I feel the same yeah. way about your family. And thank you for the kind words, Marty. That we, we are really happy to um, and feel really uh, grateful to be able to preserve this county's history and share it with others. Keep it up. Keep going. We, we will. <laughs> And, and Jack, thank you for all that you do and for that your family does. You guys do really important work. Um, I know that none of us are, I mean, it's a sad thing, industry Indeed. to be in, and it, but it's a part of life, death is, that, you know, that everybody has to deal with. And um, it's important that you guys are, you know, you're there for the community and to give people that final um, goodbye and, you know, help them um, through those times. So uh, we well, really I appreciate Thanks for all you do, and I wish everybody yes. that's on this uh, Zoom uh, I mean, a, a, a safe holiday and happy holiday, you know, through the season. Yeah. Well, thank so. you, and thank you guys all for coming, and um, we hope you join us for the next one. We'll let you know what, what the next uh, topic we share. If you have any ideas of things that you'd like to see in the future, let us know. We're always happy to take ideas, so, all right. so thanks again thanks, for Natalie. joining. Have a good night. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everybody. Bye. See you, Jack. Okay, Mark.